Oh my god, you know this thing has a button I can use to start it remotely, but am I using it? Nope. And this isn't level, sorry if that bugs you or it bugs me. Sorry if it doesn't bug you, it bugged me. Hi. Hi. My name is Danny Aiden Stone. Welcome to the first ever episode of the Big Queer Storytime podcast. I'm uh, aiming to do as little editing as possible, so if it's awkward, bumpy, and weirdly paced, uh, so am I. I'm calling it the Big Queer Podcast because, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm calling it Big Queer Storytime. It's a podcast. Apparently we do those by video now. You can listen to it by audio. I don't know how the internet works anymore. I'm too old for it. I'm calling it Big Queer Storytime because I'm a big old queer and this is story time. My goal here is to dig out all of the mind-blowing, probably mostly 90 era, 90s era, bi and pan and trans slash genderqueer slash non-binary and intersex and other magazines, um, personal essays, short fiction, and everything else I can find that you don't even know exists. I'm doing this because I am so tired of the discourse. Which discourse? All discourse. All of it. Just like, think of a discourse. What we call discourse is just, there's going to be a lot of swearing in these. I'm just going to warn you now. I'm really freaking tired of the discourse. And I, for some reason, the thing that bothers me about it the most well, it's kind of two things. It's double-sided. One, it's like you guys have traveled back in time. Like, like we had all of this amazing culture and discussion and community and like people exploring gender and sexuality and activism in all of these powerful ways. And then around 2015, and I'm going to do a whole video about this probably in the near future. It's like people hurled themselves bodily backwards. And now we're at 2020 and we've gotten to the point where I swear to God, I would bet that someone who's coming out now and coming to social media looking for community probably hear, probably a lot of people hear about all of the things that could be wrong with them in the opinion of their peers in the community before they even know what they are. Like, you're not coming out of the straight, cis, etc. world that hates you into safety. You're coming out of the world that hates and ignores you into a world where there are people like you who love you and support you, and also there are people who loathe you, and also some of the people who love you and support you for, like, your sexual orientation would like to throw you under a train for the pronoun you just used, or the label you used to describe your gender, or your romantic or sexual orientation, or whatever the hell it is. There is no safety. It's bullshit okay it's absolutely fucking bullshit um and as much as i'm sure you would love to hear me go on and on and on about that i've got some really cool stuff to show you and i'm gonna start right now it is as i record this it is september 23rd it is celebrate bisexuality day which for some reason i never remember until i see something on it on like Twitter or Tumblr or Facebook, like there, I don't know if there's ever been a year when I remember any, any queer holiday before it happened. 
I'm saying this and realizing that's true of literally all holidays. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Okay, I've got a bunch of old, going back to 91 old. This is not from 91, but this is issues of Anything That Moves, which is a super amazing buy magazine. You're going to love this. But as much as you're going to love this, I'm going to start first with this, which was in my stack of Anything That Moves Is. Now, I got these for free at um, San Francisco Bicon this past January. Um, there were wonderful people who brought huge stacks of old issues and t-shirts saying Anything That Moves in the magazine's logo. And I just like stocked up with one of everything I could get. Um, and now you benefit. And in that bin, there is the program from the 1990 National Bisexual Conference, San Francisco, June 20 to 24. Literally, this was 20 years ago today. I know that because, I mean, that date span covers the 23rd, but also because the inside front cover is the declaration, the entire text of the declaration for Bisexual Pride Day in San Francisco for June 23rd, 1990. And I think this might have been, I didn't check, I had time to check and I forgot. Uh, this might have been the actual origin of Celebrate Bisexuality Day, Bi Pride Day, whatever you want to call it. I think this was the first one. I think this is why it's now. Um, there are a couple of really cool things. I'm not going to read you the program from a conference 20 years ago, but there are a few really amazing tiny little things in here that I want to show you before. We do more of a story time, story time. Um. No, um, no. Quick, quick fact check here. Quick correction. I confused June 23rd with September 23rd and by Pride Day with Celebrate Bisexuality Day. Um, those are different. June is not September. I'm not sure how many other people are aware of that, but I learned that last night after I recorded the video. Those are different seasons, even. Also, at some point, I say that um, the 1990 conference was 20 years ago. It was 30. 30 years ago. I don't approve of that. I do not approve this message. Except for the part about June and September, which I do think is important information to know. Um, Celebrate Bisexuality Day actually started in 1999, and apparently the reason it's September 23rd is that the same activists, I think, who created the bi flag, Wendy Curry, Michael Page, and Gigi Raven... Raven... Will sorry, Gigi Raven Wilbur. Um, we're really tired all of the just constant battling of bi activism and said we need a party and it should be on a weekend so more people will come and have be partying about bisexuality. I don't know. And um, they said, well, it should be in September because Freddie Mercury's birthday was in September. Now, I think it's also possible that they were saying this in September and wanted to have a party right away. But Freddie Mercury's birthday is a real good cover story. That is a reason to have a birthday any year. And um, the 23rd was a Saturday that year, and it was apparently also... Um, the date of September 23rd was apparently also, I think, um, I think it was Gigi Raven Wilbur's birthday. So, they did it then. And I just love this as an origin story for something we still celebrate to every year today on a wider and wider scale. Like, let's have a party, it's gonna be my birthday, we love Freddie Mercury, 
let's go. This is how our community does. It's disorganized and chaotic bisexual joyfulness and I love it. Now back to your regularly scheduled programming. Besides that, I mean, that's fucking cool, right? Um, and the reason, it says, welcoming the 1990 bi National Bisexual Conference to San Francisco, commending the bisexual rights community for its leadership in the cause of social justice and memorializing the mayor to declare, what, what the hell kind of a sentence that is, I don't know, June 23rd, 1990, Bisexual Pride Day in San Francisco. And there's a bunch of whereases. Whereas San Francisco will host the 1990 National Bisexual Conference um, under the leadership of BIPOL, that's capital B, lowercase i, capital P-O-L, a San Francisco-based organization working for the rights of bisexuals, lesbians, and gay men. Um, and whereas the theme of the conference is to educate, advocate, agitate, and celebrate, um, blah, 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 and, um, whereas the contributions of bisexuals in developing AIDS service projects, combating discrimination, and advocating for social justice, have long been undervalued or discounted by most of society. Uh, and whereas the 1990 National Bi Conference offers the bisexual community an opportunity to showcase some of its extraordinary work and leadership in establishing model AIDS programs and working to build a society free of discrimination and injustice. And whereas the 1990 National Bisexual Conference gives all people the occasion to finally end the silence about the numbers of bisexual persons who have died of AIDS. And okay, sidebar, which they don't give, um, but nobody counted like there were organizations and public health organizations that tracked how many gay men died of aids um at the time like they would they tracked this stuff by sexual orientation and i haven't looked into how they did that but you know um it was a thing and nobody was tracking how many bisexuals died of HIV or AIDS until now I'm like, can you die of HIV? Let's focus. No one was no one was tracking bisexual AIDS related deaths until I wanna say the late, late, late eighties. And I believe if um I think if I remember right it was the work of Dr. David Loria, L-O-U-R-E-A, if you want to go play on Google, um, in San Francisco, being like, hey, there, there's a big data, data gap here that you might want to fix in the interest of public health and also of the people literally dying of this. Like, he was the one who got San Francisco to start tracking bisexual deaths um, related to AIDS, and then, um, it became a thing nationally because it was, it was a thing in San Francisco, basically, um, that's the short version. Literally, they were not tracking bisexual deaths, like, that trips me the fuck out, especially because at the time, you know, through the 80s, um, bisexuals were being demonized by both the straight and gay communities for spreading HIV and were, you know, considered the bridge that brought it from the gay community to the straight community, which, wow, um, let's play some victim blaming games. 
And I'm like, okay, so you're going to trash people, but you're not going to track their deaths. That's okay, that's consistent in your level of hatred, but it's rude. Um, so it gives all people, when they say it gives all people this conference the occasion to finally end the silence about the numbers of bisexual persons who have died of AIDS, they mean that very literally. They're not like, oh, you know, this is like, you should all learn about like the like AIDS in the bi community too, and like we should support each other. They mean literally. Um, there are numbers here that you are only gonna learn about at this conference probably, and um, this community is doing some, some serious work here that is ending this silence. And to recognize the tremendous leadership contributions of bisexual activists in the fight against the killer disease, and whereas, this is the last one, um, whereas the week of the 1990 National Bisexual Conference is a, is a time for San Franciscans to affirm the dignity and worth of their bisexual friends, family members, co-workers, neighbors, parents, and partners, and to dedicate ourselves to confronting biphobia and homophobia in all of its forms, now, therefore, be it all, you know, all the good stuff. Um, you know, further resolved um, that they're recognizing the conference and the leadership role bisexuals play in the struggle for justice for all sexual minority persons by declaring Saturday, June 23rd, 1990, Bisexual Pride Day in San Francisco. Um, that declaration, for you history nerds, is from June 18th, 1990. This is the community I came out into, all right? Like, not, not just the bi community, but the Bay Area bi community, and not just the Bay Area bi community, but a community where it was possible to see that by Pan and other multifarious people fight. We have a culture and a history of fighting for social justice and, um, and public health activism and incredible silencing and again incredible incredible networking and social justice and like uniting to work for everyone even like no matter how other groups no matter what the relationship between our community and others is we're fighting for social justice for everyone and that is not what i see when i explore our spaces you know, in these times, and I want you all to know what it is that we have here. The This community is a freaking gem. Okay, just a couple more things from this, and this might actually end up being a separate video, recording, reading from the anything that moves one, because I don't want to put out, like, hour-long videos, mostly because no one else does. I like an hour-long video, but I have a toddler and I tend to be like, I can't watch that whole thing. I'm not going to watch it. Okay. Um, it also, the very next thing is, there's just a tiny bit of history and I'm closing this for now. The 1990 National Bisexual Conference is dedicated to the memories of John Horn, Barry Kahn, Cookie Mueller, Alan Rockway, Cynthia Slater. This space is because I actually have a vague idea of who Cynthia Slater was. Marco Vossi. Dr. Del Pino Wallacafra. And to the many other bisexual people who have died of AIDS. Uh, I feel like though this is just a list of people who are going to need their own videos. Um, welcome to the 1990 National Bisexual Conference, and I just want to read a little 
little bit of that because it's freaking amazing important history. And I just love what it says. Just as Stonewall marked the crystallization of the gay and lesbian liberation movement, so does this conference mark the beginning of the coalescing of our bisexual community. Because, like, I mean, they're going to talk about this, but here I'm going to talk about it first. Haha. <laughs> you know, bi people were at Stonewall. Sylvia Rivera was bi. Um, I want to say Marsha P. Johnson was bi, but I can no longer remember what where I know that from. Um, like, Brenda Howard, you know, was the bi activist who's credited as being the mother of pride for doing so much of the organizing work to make the first, um, you know, the one year anniversary of Stonewall happen, which became our annual Pride Parades. Um, people all over the place, just bye bye bye. Will not break into a Backstreet Boys song. I will not. Um, bi people have existed forever, blah, blah, blah. The first bi organization that I'm aware of in uh, the United States was from the early 1970s in New York, um, which deserves also its own video. Like, this is. We existed, we were activists, and we knew we were bi before, you know, the 1990 National Bisexual Conference, but um, this is the era when it had started to become really obvious to the bi community that we were not accepted as bisexuals. Those of you who are ace or ace allies or arrow or arrow allies will go, hey, this starts to sound familiar, you know. We were not accepted for our orientation. We were accepted for seeming gay enough to be in a gay space, you know? Um, much like a lot of trans people at the time. Nothing at this time was called LGBT. Um, this was very much the gay and lesbian rights era, or the gay rights era, which happened to maybe include lesbians, but not as women. This was not a very inclusive time. And... Yeah, it was dawning on people um, more and more and more and more that we needed to organize around this. And I say we not because I'm arrow ace. And you could say that I'm bi-oriented arrow-ace in the sense that, you know, I would love functional queer platonic relationships with people of any gender. Um, but when I came out, I didn't... The short version is that I figured I was bi, and I was part of the bi community for decades before I was like, wait... What's, 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 that's called what? Um, and the beauty of the bi community is that it's frequently very actively arrow and ace inclusive on purpose. And, um, they kind of don't care why you qualify to be in the community or what you're doing there. Like, they kind of can't afford to, but also why would we? Um, okay, so they're gonna say, this is an historic occasion which will shape the growth of bisexuals across the nation. We are here to st celebrate our strength as a community and as a people. Through discovering the diversity and the talents of each other, we can realize our true power. It is through the National Bisexual Network that we can be connected to our history and to our community. The history that I really want you to hear. The spring before the 1987 National March on Washington for lesbian and gay rights. Oh, there's a story there. It wasn't until the 93 March on Washington that 
that by was included in the name. And that was a really hard battle. Trans people were included in the program, but somehow didn't make it into the name, which I'm very curious about because one of my favorite stories about bi activism is that the 1993 March Organizing Committee evidently said to the bi activists, you know, we'll include you if you stop fighting us for trans inclusion too. And the bi activists basically said, fuck you, <laughs> and continued fighting. Um, and I really want that to be a widely known story because this is a community that's had trans inclusion and huge trans overlap for since day one. Um, okay, so the spring before the 1987 National March on Washington for Lesbian and Gay Rights, women from the Boston Bisexual Women's Network conceived of the idea to create a national bisexual contingent at the march. Out of the organization of that contingent was born the greater vision of a national bisexual network to knit together scattered bisexual groups across the country to provide cohesion and community and proof of our existence. So sad. Not only did we exist, but we were flourishing. After the march, the idea was taken up by bisexuals across the country in a bi-coastal effort. You know they had to get bi coastal in there by Paul the bi gay lesbian political action group of the Bay Area ran with the idea and began to organize now after the last three years of letters meetings all over the country and all too many long distance phone calls a consensus has been reached that a national bisexual network is important and necessary for our identity awesome. um just like pivotal, pivotal by history stuff like that from all accounts that I've heard that 1987 gay lesbian and gay March was pivotal in the creation of a bi movement. So many bisexuals met up there intentionally and unintentionally. So many people there found out that there were bi communities and was a bi culture and there was like a bi dance and a, and a bi conference that ran alongside like the March schedule. There was all this stuff. It was like an explosion of activism and networking and oh my god, you, you guys have a newsletter. We have a newsletter. I brought some. Do you want to see it? And and what? Uh, you guys are in the next town over and you've got like a bi brunch group. I want in on that and just all of this stuff. Um, which is kind of ironic. Like it's really interesting to me that the lesbian and gay and nobody else in the name March became such an explosion of powerful bi activism. But that'll happen. Um, is there something else? Oh, I wanted to show you one other thing. Maybe two other things. One other thing that I love is there's an entire page of the um, people on the steering committee, administrative and office, dance production, fundraising, just like on and on and on. Parade, program book quilt. Um, Special needs, people of color caucus. And I noticed under logistics, it says Ron Franklin, co chair, Lonnie Kahumanu, co chair, Gina Galensky, David Loria, Hester Locks, that's L O X, comma, piano tuner. I feel like there's a story there. But I also kind of feel like the story might just be that they really needed to keep a piano in tune. Like, I really want to know what was going on. There wasn't, was there a talent show? Was it the dance? Did they have some, because there's a disc jockey. 
under dance production, so it's not like they just had someone playing the piano and they were like, this piano someone loaned us is crap, it keeps going out of tune, we need a piano tuner, like, I know I can find this out and I will find this out. It would be so funny if I was like, today we have with us Hester Locks, the official piano tuner for the 1919. Like, let's, let's get that story. That's important to me. But wait, there's more. I actually found Hester Locks. Sadly, she is no longer with us. Um, but the reason I found out that this was, in fact, her on Facebook and that, um, she was no longer with us is that somebody from her kindergarten class, their class picture and identified her among a couple of other kids and specified that Hester lived in South San Francisco and described herself as an out by piano tuner. I'm sorry, an out by folk dancing piano tuner. I feel like folk dancing is the key here. I feel like the kind of people who say, hey, I'm an out by folk dancer are also the people who need you to know that they are piano tuner in case perhaps you have a piano that needs tuning. I don't know what I'm saying here. I am saying this with complete love for all out folk dancers, so they're just freaking delightful. I also really, really love that her kindergarten classmate reminisced on Facebook about how she came home and met with him and met his family one time in 96 and had glitter in her hair and his kids just thought she was amazing because like that is such that's such a little mention but real queer story i feel like like when you have glitter somewhere about your person and the kids just think you're the greatest and you just want to be like it's because i'm queer <laughs> this could just be me <laughs> i don't think so though I feel like this is all very much of a piece. The glittery at by folk dancing piano tuner thing is just like a complete snapshot of a particular by subculture. It's like, we need to get the sociologists on this stat. Okay, thanks for listening. And I'm sad to report that I will not be able to have the piano tuner on a future episode.